Hello again, I'm John, I'm a psychotherapist. Uh, a few days ago, I answered somebody's question online about trauma, and I think the question was, can I ever been completely cured of my, my trauma? And uh, I gave my little answer. Um, I have a very valued colleague, Roz Townsend, um, who we are chatting to today. Roz is based down in, in Cornwall, but she has an enormous wealth of experience um, with this business of, of, of trauma, people suffering from post-traumatic symptoms, um, and, and importantly, how to get over it. Roz has written a book, um, the book which has become the, the go-to tome for both psychotherapists and psychologists, psychiatrists, but also for, for patients, people who are suffering from post-traumatic stress. She has a great deal of experience in this arena, and she and I both work uh, with an organisation called PTSD Resolution, um, and I think the, the web address is uh, ptsdresolution.org, and we look after and help and support and de-traumatise uh, traumatised service veterans in the UK. Roz, how are you doing? I'm fine, thanks, John, fine. People have been sending in me real questions to me about various aspects of of mental and emotional health and about well-being and and one of the things that's come up quite a few times actually is is the the whole subject of trauma and i know that it's an area where you've got a huge amount of experience both in general trauma and also with um with 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 services veterans in in the uk um and so i thought what better thing to do than to just you and i to have a chat about the whole subject of trauma and and, and one of the things that I'm very well aware of is that you've written a book which I think has become the the authoritative tome for psychotherapists but also for for clients in understanding trauma what it really is and 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 how you deal with it Could you, can you just tell us more about your book to start with yeah of course John well the reason that it came into being was simply because there didn't seem to be anything available for people who were affected by trauma either personally or perhaps a family member that was exper had experienced trauma and was suffering because of it. And I wanted to draw on the experience that I've had working in that field to really put something together that explained it in a way that people could understand immediately. So it's a book that doesn't use lots of long sort of psychobabble type words. It keeps it very, very simple, which indeed is all we need as psychotherapists and people affected by trauma to really do some good work around it. Yeah, it's funny you should say that. I, mean, you, you, I know, you know, you, have, I, you and I have been therapising together for quite some time and a big part of, of, of my practice is about psychoeducation. You know, do you understand oh. why you have this huge visceral reaction to something? What and and this is what's happening inside your brain and inside your mind while that's going on. And and that seems to take the sting out of it, doesn't it? It seems to engage the observing self to some degree. It's oh I've just got really upset or this has happened and 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 now I understand why it's a lot easier to it's, it's a lot less distressing I guess. Absolutely. And I often find, you know, when I meet a, a client or patient for the first time, and perhaps they are in a state of huge distress, in the first session, we won't necessarily do any work together, as in working to de-traumatize it using specific techniques. But what we will do is, first of all, I'll understand what has gone on for them in general terms. And secondly, we will, as you say, do some psychoeducation. What I find is that because after that, they go away with a huge sense of relief of even though it's still horrible, I now understand what's happening and why it's been happening. Often by the next session, without having actually addressed the trauma at all, there have still been some improvements or they feel they're coping better. Most importantly, they feel as if they have an element of control back in their lives, which is a huge thing. It, uh, very much so. Echoes my thoughts, my observations and, and the way I see it. Just can we go back to the beginning for you you and i can sit and talk about this all day i know and we we have on many occasions but for for somebody who's who's looking at this video and they don't really know what a trauma is can you talk a little bit about what is a trauma um how does it how does it get there why do some people get traumatized and some don't 
Okay, so several questions there. You've asked me in one go, but I will do my best to put something together that's, around that's all of those. So I can drink my tea. Absolutely. So first of all, what is a trauma? A trauma is any event which to the person experiencing it is either is or is importantly perceived to be extremely threatening. And that can be threatening in terms of to life and limb, or it can be threatening as in terms of a psychological threat, some kind of threat to their psychological integrity. And it's really important to note that whatever that event is, it doesn't actually have to be threatening. It is if they feel that it is very threatening to them. That can leave someone traumatized given the right sort of circumstances, which we'll look at in a little bit more detail later. But basically, as I think you've already mentioned in one of your other videos, um, trauma is all to do with something called our fight, flight or freeze response. And let's take a very basic example. Obviously, fight or flight, it evolved back in the day so that if we were walking across the Great Plains, happy as Larry and a lion wandered into view, then a massive burst of stress chemicals being released into our system would take us up into a state where we were as fast and as strong as possible in order to fight or run away from that lion. And that would make a series of changes in our body, heart rate increasing, breathing coming more rapid and shallow, eyesight and hearing becoming more acute, and non-essential stuff like our digestion shutting down. When we encountered that lion, we would then usually take vigorous physical activity, and we would literally use up that response as we ran away from the lion or we fought it. So that by the time we were safely back in camp or standing on top of the lion victorious, we'd be on our way back down towards a state of calm. We then have a, I don't know, a nice slice of roast buffalo, good night's sleep in the cave. System returned to normal, fight, flight, saved our life. What happens in trauma, however, is something slightly different. When we go up into that state of fight or flight, it's not only our physical body that makes changes. Our brain also undergoes a series of changes. And what essentially happens in the brain is that a primitive bit of the brain, which I like to refer to as the security guard, takes over in order that it can take immediate life-saving actions or decisions in a split second. But that security guard, along with that first part of his job description, if you like, also has a second part. And that is that if we survive whatever that trauma is and we come out on the other side of it, he wants to make sure that he can protect us from anything similar if it were to pop up in the future. And so he stores almost like a set of primitive templates for danger a series of very, very, very roughly sketched or drawn patterns for what that danger entails. If we go back to the lion scenario, for example, and take it back to that point where we've run away from the lion and we're at that stage at the top there. So when we're there faced with the lion, that security guard starts taking snapshots or drawing sketches. And perhaps he would sketch a picture of a lion, but he might also sketch the sand underfoot or a pile of rocks that was nearby, or the blue sky overhead, or a purple flower that happened to be growing in the vicinity. As we then ran away from that lion, our system would calm down, and the upper thinking bit of our brain would start adding some context and detail to those templates. So although the lion was a very good template to hang on to, the sand, the purple flower, and the blue sky, actually they were only part of the background and if we were ran away successfully or we were in a state of calm that's the processing that would take place in trauma what tends to happen is that for some reason those levels of stress remain high and the security guard remains in charge and so that context and detail is never added to those templates and so not only does the lion which was the real danger that we want to hang on to a template for remain as something to be on guard against but also perhaps the sand or the blue sky or the purple flower. Yeah, and all that happens subconsciously, of course. So we don't necessarily know what those templates are that this security guard has stored for future reference. And so perhaps someone who's been involved in a, I don't know, a nasty road traffic accident, which was on a road that was lined with tall trees. The tall trees were probably nothing to do with the accident. But as part of the background, he might well have stored that as something to be on guard against. Later, perhaps even a few weeks, months later, they might be walking down an avenue of trees and suddenly 
this primitive part of the brain would fire fight flight, which would involve very strong symptoms, either in the direction of perhaps panic or anxiety, if flight were fired, or perhaps if there were other people around feeling very angry or as if they were under threat, perhaps getting very irritable with people around them if the fight part fired. And obviously, because those symptoms seem to come from nowhere sometimes, it can be a very distressing situation to live with. That, it, it's interesting you use that phrase, this, the symptoms come from nowhere. And I, mm. you know, it's something I often hear from, from clients. Mm. Nine, you know, nine times out of ten, I don't know where it came from. There was no, there was no okay. forewarning. And, 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 and I always explain how this primitive bit of the brain fires much, much quicker than the thinking brain. And, and, and on many occasions, it may have actually kept us alive in, in, in some way. Absolutely. And it's, it's really important as well, I think, when, you know, when we're talking to anyone about trauma, for them to understand that all of that stress response, that fight or flight response, is on a continuum. And so a lot of this is equally relevant to somebody who isn't experiencing trauma. So, for example, if for any reason someone's stress levels rise up to that point where that primitive bit of the brain takes over, then that bit of the brain, because it is essential if a lion turns up, that it does act literally quicker than rational thought, it acts. And that means that if perhaps we've got very angry with someone, someone will, you know, as happened with one of my clients uh, a couple of years ago now, uh, where he, uh, unfortunately, he got very, very angry in an office environment and ended up, you know, punching his boss on the nose, which wasn't a rational decision at all wasn't something he had intended to do but that primitive bit of the brain literally acted before rational thought had got its boots on took action and then as so often happens ran away and left him to pick up the pieces as he gradually calmed down from the event again where a trauma trigger is involved that primitive bit of the brain because it's essential that that is kept intact should a lion happen to turn up it will take action before rational thought gets a look in and so a lot of the work that we do, and I know certainly you do, is about helping people to calm down, to make sure that they can stay in that bit of the brain that can make decisions in line with what they want to be happening and how they want to react. I, I know very much I've got, got clients who've had you know, very, very similar issues um, where they have bopped somebody on the nose in totally... Uh, inappropriate circumstances. I don't know if there's ever appropriate circumstances for bopping someone <laughs> on the nose, but, um, you, you know, and it's later become a, a matter for the police and, and, and courts to deal with. And it's been, when you find out that that person used to, for example, be a service, you know, they used to be in the army or the Navy or the Air Force, and they've, got, they've been through some from really difficult times and they've, they've seen action, it can, it can really help that person and it can help court and probation services to understand that this this person has actually been traumatized and and what that really means absolutely and i think it's really important to remember and something i always say to people because often if a client has perhaps behaved in certain ways and whether that is they have got very angry inappropriately or perhaps they're just unable to go into a shop because they find an environment you know as, as simple for many of us as popping into the supermarket an absolutely terrifying experience they are almost judging themselves as if they have either become a bad person or they have become a terrified and pathetic person yeah so one of the things that i always explain to a client early on in our work together is that you know because if they have been reacting in certain ways to things so perhaps they've been firing off with anger every five minutes or perhaps responding with panic to what they know should be things they're equal to such as popping into a supermarket perhaps they've come to have quite a low opinion of themselves or their behavior or a feeling as if they've turned into someone they don't like very much and one thing that i make clear is that while when they have the knowledge of what is going on and how to put it right, it is absolutely their responsibility to keep their brain under their control. To look back and judge themselves for actions that actually their rational brain didn't have a look in at all at the time isn't helpful to anyone because all that does is raise stress responses. If that amygdala, that security guard, the primitive bit of the brain, whatever we want to refer it to, to it as, takes action before rational thought 
our job is to make sure that it isn't doing that, not to beat ourselves up for what happens if one of those slips through the net. So I think that's a really important part of what we do as therapists. Great, great way to look at it. I, I also talk to, to clients quite a lot a bit about smell and why smell is sometimes the thing that mm. kicks things off off first and I, I know you wrote about that in your book and 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 you put it uh, uh, I forget the exact words you, you you talk about it much better than I do tell, tell us about smell and why it <laughs> bothers people well I think smell is a fascinating sense because of all the senses it's the one sense that has a fast track route straight to that security guard that primitive bit of the brain and so when we smell something it doesn't go as the other senses do via almost a, a sorting house in the brain and then get filtered through. It literally goes straight there. And that is why smells have such a, an ability to take us right back to something immediately. And interestingly, and this is something that often surprises clients when I, I speak to them about it, that's not just a negative thing. It's not just, you know, in the form of a smell triggering a flashback or something. It can equally be a really nice sense. I think in my book I mention um, an example of when I went into a cinema up in Red Roof recently and the, the, the smell of the polish and whatever it was they'd used in there for a second, it, I was back in my grandma's house. And that was a place of incredible warmth and happiness. And it was lovely just for a moment. But it has power to take you right back there, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. Uh, I, and very often, I mean, people will say, oh, uh, I can't stand the smell of hospitals and doctors. Oh. And if, if you ask them why not, though, there's no real logical answer. It's not the cortex that's, that, that's, that's worked yeah. it out, is it? it? And maybe it's something that happened to them when they were one day old or three weeks old or maybe it was them being born or, or or you know somebody stabbed them when they were a week old well actually it was a doctor with a mask on and and uh, gave them an injection that kept them alive but the, the the context of it is never there is it and that that's that's the important thing and also i think it is again really important in as we try to improve understanding of emotional health is that every single bit of what we're talking about is on a continuum so we can have a very mild pattern match to a smell which takes us back perhaps to something that's mildly unpleasant and we might just not be comfortable going into a doctor's or if the smell of tcp because we had a nasty cut on our leg when we were five and were quite scared right through to the extreme reaction where the smell of perhaps a certain cleaning fluid is enough to have us, you know, literally in abject terror, unable to function. And I think this understanding of all emotional well-being as being on a continuum rather than very box-like diagnoses where someone either has something or they don't have it is far more useful because then we can work with everything with a holistic understanding underlying all of it. I'm glad you raised the subject of labels. Um, I, we, we could be here for several hours debating that one and the advisability of labels, the usefulness of labels to, to some people. But that, that great label, PTSD, post-traumatic mm. stress disorder, and as I think you said in your, your, your book, you don't see it as a disorder, and nor do I. I never have. I see it as quite a natural reaction to, um, to a set of circumstances. Mm, absolutely. I, I mean, in the book, and there have been many, many people in this field who have suggested that the D is not a useful part of that term. Um, in the book, I refer to it simply as post-traumatic stress, because actually what it's telling us is that that person has a fully functioning fight or flight system. But that what has happened is that they haven't yet been given the right circumstances for that system to be switched off. And I think when you're explaining to clients as well about why some people, this is another big issue for a lot of the people that I see. Well, all my mates went through that as well, a veteran might say. But why am I the one that's ended up like this? Am I weaker than them? Is there something wrong with me? No, it's often a perfect storm of things that come together that cause someone to have a post-traumatic stress reaction to something. And that's things like, for example, levels of stress being high before and especially after the trauma has occurred because of course if we go back to our lion scenario the time when the context and detail and the things that have been stored 
they are totally irrelevant, like the blue sky overhead, are ejected from that pack of templates, if you like, because they're going through a messy divorce at the time, or they're perhaps a, you know, a medical worker on who's dealing with a very difficult rotor change, or they're a military uh, personnel who is on a difficult tour of duty, then there's never that calm to return to afterwards. So the trauma can't be processed. And I think that's something that's really important to remember about the, you know, the, the way that we work with this using the rewind technique is that what it essentially does is it mimics the natural process of calming down from trauma that occurs when we are given the right external circumstances to do so. And so because of that, because it actually works with the way in which a brain would naturally recover from trauma, it's not a distressing process at all. And in fact, you know, and it's something that often makes me smile. Only recently, a couple of the veterans that I was working with, working with some very distressing trauma memories, they actually went to sleep during that work that we were doing because they were so deeply relaxed by the end of it. One of them actually snored loudly, which, uh, you know, did make me smile even at the time. Um, so it, it's, it's an approach that, that really works in a very gentle way, but a very effective way. Yeah, I, I mean, I get, it's a question I get asked a lot, you know, what's the rewind, what's EMDR, what's visual kinesthetic dissociation, um, all these different things. I, they, they all seem to have some value and I wouldn't knock them. I was trained in um, EMDR myself and, and used it for, you know, a, a, a few years. But it, it was one of those things that I always struggled a little, little bit to buy into. Um, and it, 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 there was a couple of studies done which now shows that EMDR can um, be responsible for installing false memories. And uh, again, another interesting subject that we could, we could talk about. But um, it, it, EMDR also always seemed to me to be quite invasive. The thing I like about the rewind technique, and out of, I think, I think three or four different methods that I've been trained in over the years, is the rewind is a not the least bit invasive. It doesn't matter what terrible things happened to you. Um, you don't need to tell me about them as part of that, that process. Um, some people, of course, do want to tell you, and it's important to give them the opportunity to do that, isn't it? We, we, we've got to acknowledge what caused that, that level of distress. But um, the, the, the rewind technique, I can, I'm touching wood as I say this, has never in any of the clients that I've been dealing with um, caused a, a, things to get worse. And in the vast majority of cases, it has caused them to get considerably, considerably better and very quickly. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, I think that all of the techniques that are used, one of the things that perhaps, you know, is a big part as to how useful it will be is if that technique is set within a context of understanding on the part of the therapist as well. And so there are some techniques where perhaps people learn an individual technique that they can deliver. And I know having talked to practitioners of other versions of trauma therapy, that those therapists that have an underlying understanding of trauma, of how it happens in the brain, and they are applying that technique in line with that, are probably going to have much better results than someone who has simply learned a technique in isolation and then applies it because the thing is every single client and obviously I work with a, a large number of clients every week of my working life every single client will present with something slightly different or a quirk or something that doesn't quite fit the textbook or sometimes doesn't fit the textbook at all and the only way in which you can deal with that successfully is if you have an underlying understanding that underpins whatever technique it is you're applying. And so I think that that's a key part of it. I've certainly, you know, met people, spoken with people who have had huge success with other ways of addressing trauma. And I wouldn't want to knock any of those ways. But at the same time, for me, simply because of my understanding of trauma and the results that I see that it gets, rewind seems to sit most comfortably I tick the most boxes in terms of the essentials that we need naturally to calm down from trauma and process it. And one of the key ones of that is engendering a sense of deep calm in the patient client before you go anywhere near any work, because without that, the right bits of the brain aren't switched on to process it. 
I, I, I do accept that. It, it seems to me that any kind of um, work to do with trauma needs to dissociate the, the, the client from um, the memories of what happened and, and separate them out. And, and I think y you and I did our training together on this one. It, it's a matter of, it's a matter of recontextualizing it and leaving it in the past. Is that, that's, that's often my way of explaining it. Absolutely. It's allowing the bit of the brain that can, you know, add context and detail, the, the upper cortex, as it were, to communicate with the boss and you know, to, to, sorry, to communicate with the security guard. And, you know, I often explain it to a client that if we again go back because it's a useful scenario that people can relate to. Let's say that that security guard has safely run and got us to run away from the lion. We're sat then around the campfire, finally calming down. And because those stress levels are then lowering, the upper cortex that I like to refer to as the boss then starts waking up. And if they were able to have a conversation, which they literally do in neurological terms, that upper cortex starts communicating with that primitive bit of the brain, it would go something along the lines of, okay, mate, so let's see what you got from that experience. Okay, well, you've got a picture of a lion there. Yeah, we'll hang on to that one because lions are always dangerous. We want to stay on guard against those. But hang on a minute, you've drawn some sand. Now, the sand in itself isn't dangerous, so we can get rid of that one. And there is a pile of rocks there. Now, yeah, we do need to be on guard against rocks if there might be a lion hidden behind them, but generally rocks. So immediately that conversation is happening. And the only way that can happen is if the brain is in a calm state. There's, there's two questions in my mind that I constantly play with. Um, and it goes back to something you were talking about earlier. Why are some people um, suffering from post-traumatic um, symptoms and some aren't? And there's, there, there are issues, yes, of course, to do with you know, layers of, of, of trauma and how stressed somebody is at the time that that event happens. But, it, but I also go back to that, that fundamental question of how is somebody's mental and emotional health? It, have, they, have they got strong foundation for their, their mental health at that moment? And to put it in human givens terms, are, there, are their needs being well met? at the moment that they experienced it. Absolutely, that, that, that's fundamental. And I think, you know, the whole discussion around emotional needs is perhaps one that we could have a, at a future date. But one of the things that I often explain to a client, again, when a question that often pops up is something along the lines of, why is it that some days I can go to the supermarket and manage things, whereas other days it's a complete nightmare? And the way I like to explain it to them is this. If you, you think of those, um, those shapes sort of toys that you get when you're a child, where you have to put the square and the square and the star in the star. If we're calm, so if at that period in our lives, we are managing well, we haven't got any major background stresses going on, we haven't got, uh, you know, we're sleeping well, everything is about our system functioning well and calmly. Then even if a trauma has occurred in the past, those templates or those, those shapes, it needs to be an exact pattern match in order for a trigger to fire. So those templates become more specific as we are in a calmer state. If, however, we're more stressed, so let's say that particular day a bill has landed on the map that puts our financial future in jeopardy and that's caused a massive row between us and our partner, then our system is naturally higher up that scale towards stress. And it's almost as if someone takes a file to the edges of the shapes on that shape sorter so that pretty much anything will fit through. And so whereas on a very specific day or sorry, on a very calm day, it might be that a particular shop that a difficult incident occurred in is a problem. On a day where we're already stressed, that template becomes bigger and bigger and less sort of clear around the edges so that any shop will fit through. I like that one. That's a, that's a good analogy. Mm. What, what, what can be done to help us to be more resilient? What can, what can be, I, I suppose, two, two questions. I, I, I could you know, chatter on about the stuff that I do, but it seems to me, how can I make myself more resilient so that I don't suffer um, post-traumatic stress in the event of, a, of, a, of a, a, an incident? Um, 
but the thing that I come across that bothers me, and I, and I did, I think mentioned it in that other video, was people who run um, critical incident first aid courses, who've got people unfortunately talking over and over and over and over um, the events, and they just keep reliving it. Absolutely, and again, that can be a really dangerous thing to do unless you know what you are doing. Your talking is hugely useful in processing trauma, don't get me wrong. Most people will naturally recover from and calm down from a trauma they've experienced. And for most people, the very act of sitting with someone who importantly understands them or they feel safe with. Now, that doesn't mean that that has to be a counsellor or a trained therapist. It can be someone, a crewmate on an ambulance or a colleague in a police station or a comrade if you're in the armed forces. The important thing is, again, back to basics, we need to be calm to process a trauma. Now, in order to describe that trauma, what's happened to us, to that person, we have to use our upper thinking brain. And because that keeps it turned on while we are talking about that trauma, that naturally starts to add context and detail. So for a lot of people, talking can be really helpful. But there are certain people, and I certainly see this with some clients who turn up, who almost have a preconceived notion that they have to or they need to talk about a trauma. And when they're talking about it, they almost go into a trance state of distress. You can see the expressions that they are actually reliving that. When that's happening, what they're doing is re-traumatizing themselves. Yeah. The brain doesn't differentiate in neurological terms between a strongly imagined event and a real one. And so when they repeatedly recount the awful car accident, they are actually repeatedly exposing themselves to it. And it's more likely that any symptoms of trauma they have are going to get worse as a result. And that is always, again, unless someone has that holistic understanding, you know, a, a situation that can arise when people are willy-nilly encouraged to talk about what's happened to them. But you asked also... <laughs> no, it's OK. Just, I mean, um, I, I just think uh, one of the little tricks that I've, I've used over the years in the, in the situation you were just talking about, I get people to describe it in the third person. So mm -hmm. he was walking along and this, this car came and knocked him over on the pedestrian crossing or you know, what, what, whatever it was. And that just that little level of dissociation while they're talking because they do want to tell me about what went wrong with them is, is just enough to just keep them keep it at, at, at arm's length to some degree and again there you know taking it back to our understanding of the brain you're essentially asking the brain to do something complicated which only the upper brain can do and as you say that achieves that dissociation so to go back to your um, other part of your question um, about how we can build resilience and avoid getting traumatized I think one of the things that, you know, is absolutely key in that is how we're meeting our emotional needs. But as I said, I think that merits uh, a, a conversation on its own around that. But in terms of perhaps some self-help stuff that people can do that can really help not only address the, the trauma that they've experienced in terms of lowering arousal levels, but also perhaps in, in advance put them in as good a state as possible is something that I often abbreviate in my notes to BER which is simply the three things that I advise all clients that I work with who are emotionally aroused in any way to do and that is breathing exercise and having some resource activities to draw on the breathing the way people are breathing I always apologize when I introduce this because you know I've got some person whose life is literally coming apart at the scene sat opposite me and then there's some stupid woman sat opposite saying look if you breathe differently it's going to really help actually it's you know it's one of the most scientifically true things that we can state about our physiology and it's really simple to understand if you think of stress as being up here and relaxation as being down here as soon as any stress chemicals enter into our system our natural subconscious response is to start breathing a bit more rapid and shallow we're taking on extra air to, so that we're ready to run away from or fight that lion and essentially our breathing looks like this big breath in don't take much notice of the out breath big breath in don't take much notice of the out breath and so on and you can see exactly what that's doing just through our breathing if we want to reverse that of course we need to do the opposite with our breathing and that is about focusing on the out breath out breath, lighter, slower in breath, out breath. And that starts taking us 
down back down towards calm and relaxation and it's so much so breathing is now very much being referred to as the remote control for the mind because it literally is our on or off switch every time we breathe in we're getting ready to do something when we breathe out we're literally saying to our system you can stand at ease now and when people learn specific breathing techniques such as 7-eleven breathing although it does go by other names as well, then that can be a hugely powerful tool for them to have in their toolbox. Equally, the second letter in it, exercise. Fight flight evolved for one reason, one reason only, it was to get us ready to run away from lions. When we run away from the lion, it calms down not only our physical body, but also because our physical body is entirely tied to what's going on in our mind. It also lowers the stress chemicals in our mind and thus puts our rational brain back in charge again. It calms us down. And it's why people often say to me anecdotally before understanding any of this, when I ask them, well, what do you do that helps at the moment? My head always feels clearer when I've been out for a cycle or a walk. It's because they've literally mopped up some of those stress chemicals and, and the final one of my little abbreviation is the r simply having some resource activities to hand and those can be anything they're not prescriptive at all as i've said you know several times one person's knitting is another person skydiving it's anything that allows you to feel calmer better after you've done it and when people have a range of these tools and techniques so that when stress enters into their life or they've been triggered by something, they have something that they know, ah, I've got the antidote for that. I can take the edge off that. It means that they gradually start shifting their system down a gear and slowly but surely they return towards a state of calm. Very often it's things that somehow are almost subconsciously you you go back to and you hadn't thought it important but it might be something that you you did when you were a teenager you know you might have been into archery or martial arts or football or something and you haven't you haven't been involved in it for 10 20 30 years but you almost instinctively want to reach back to it because it was a it was a subconscious coping mechanism back in the day and i think also you know what you're saying is absolutely right there that some of those things that are so helpful they get forgotten about or we stop doing them because the correct amount of weight in terms of what they can actually do for us as human beings isn't attached to them i think often you know in all the talk about mental health it almost seems as if when someone's distress is so great as i see so regularly in my counseling room that there must be some really complicated technique with a long name that is going to sort this out because that's what you need for that level of distress. But actually what we need to do is work in line with our physiology, what it needs. And simple things like getting out, having a run round on the football pitch, which to touch on something which I know we will return to, which is those basic emotional needs, not only gives us a sense of connection, but in terms of our body chemistry, uses up fight flight chemicals. It also boosts feel good chemicals like serotonin, which then converts to melatonin in the sleep hormone. You could go on for ages about the benefits attached to playing a 90 minute football game or anything else that does that. And we could do that for any activity that people participate in. But again, because they are not things that are seen as medical, they're not given the weight they deserve, but actually they are the foundation they are our resilience. Ros, you and I both um, started off in this thing doing some work for um, a charity called PTSD Resolution. Um, and more details of that can be found at ptsdresolution.org. And I'll, I'll put a link um, underneath this video at the end. But that is a UK-based national charity which provides um, direct help free of charge to traumatized service veterans and i know that as i said you you and i started off doing that bit together you took it to another level and um as as uh, we've mentioned a couple of times you wrote a book have you have you got a copy of the book that you can subtly wave right in front of the camera or shall i stick a, a, a picture of it up at the end. I'm afraid I'm not very good at pre-prepared plugs, John. So no, I don't, I, I don't even know where my copy it is. I've probably lent it to someone, I think. So, but no, um, please do stick something on there because obviously it appears to be a book that is helping people, which is the only thing that it was designed for really. And of course, money from every sale 
goes to PTSD resolution and that is used to directly fund treatment for um, you know, service, ex-service personnel who are suffering from the effects of post-traumatic stress. Yeah, so, and I would emphasize that if you are a, a service veteran, if you are the family, friend, anybody, and you know people who have um, been in, in, in the services, who have suffered, and, and I, I recently dealt with somebody who um, was traumatized, I think he was in his 80s, he was traumatized as a result of his national service back in the 50s, and um, was doing some work in, in bomb disposal and, and, and unfortunately there was a bomb disposal that didn't go terribly well and he said he had barely had a decent night's sleep in, in all those years and had three sessions with me and now just sleeps better than he's ever slept um, you know, since he, he was a little baby. So anybody um, can get help, um, ptsdresolution.org. And the good thing about it is, is because there is a network of therapists nationwide, people are referred to a therapist who lives within striking distance of their home, so they don't have to travel. Ros, um, it's been lovely to talk to you, it really has. I hope you're safe and that all you and your, your, your family are, are well. Yeah, lovely to talk to you, John. Thanks so much for your, your time and, and words of wisdom. And just one last important thing to mention to to you Ros, and to all of us take very good care of each other and take care of yourself thank you <laughs>